shell resonator, such as a gourd or a part of an animal, covered by animal skin. The earliest African banjo-like instruments attached these resonators to sticks, not necks and fingerboards, as on New World banjos. Strings were tied with loops, not tuning pegs, although pegs and fingerboards are found in banjos in the Caribbean in the 17th century. A fifth string, not the drum string, was added in the 19th century, and later frets, as on the guitar, were added to the fingerboard. The modern banjo was constructed out of wood and metal, which should be familiar to anyone in this audience, with its plastic or skin head giving a percussive sound to the music that it plays. There are five-string banjos with a drone string, while the four-string banjos without the drone string gained in popularity early in the 20th century. Many variants were produced in the 20th century, chiefly by attaching different necks and fingerboards, the banjo uke, the banjo mandolin, which uh, many of my friends believe combines the worst features of what <laughs> <laughs> And the six-string banjo guitar being the most prominent. In the famous Sox Hornbossel classification of musical instruments, familiar to all as musicologists and not a few folklorists, there are four main categories. Idiophones, where the sound is produced by the vibration of the body of the instrument rather than by membranes, strings, or columns of air. The membranophones, in which the sound is produced by a membrane, such as a drum. The chordophone, in which the sound is produced by strings that set air to vibrating. And the aerophones, in which the sound is produced by a column of air blown through a tube or a pipe. The banjo is usually regarded as a plucked lute or chordophone in this system. But a good argument may be made that on the grounds of its skin or plastic head that it is also a membranophone. Although part of its sound comes from the chordophonal vibration of its strings, another part of its sound and timbre, the resonance uh, that it uh, has, uh, comes from its vibrating membrane or head. And so the banjo shows its power metaphorically by defying attempts to classify it. And in so doing, the banjo deconstructs the boundaries and the most generally accepted system of musical instrument classification. An organologist's nightmare or delight, depending on how one looks at it, the banjo is the most changeable of instruments, the consummate hybrid, both fact and symbol of physical mediation, or perhaps ambiguity, if one is inclined to interpret it. Second, the banjo is a mediator in American cultural history. I'll start with an anecdote. In the 1970s, my new brother-in-law, who was black and a jazz musician, learned that I played blues guitar and that I had written about blues, and he was curious. But when he learned that I played banjo in an older clawhammer style, he was not impressed. What do you want to mess around with that thing for, he asked me. The force of his reaction I learned soon afterwards was because he identified the banjo with slavery, minstrelsy, and rip-offs of black culture. He didn't want anything to do with it. Of course, he expected me to persist, and I think he got a little perverse satisfaction out of my doing so. When I went on to play the fiddle, I half expected him to present me with a gift of some bones. <laughs> <laughs> so we know a little bit about minstrelsy and exploitation. What's not been sufficiently emphasized although it's beginning to be emphasized more, is the black-white musical interchange in which both fiddle and banjo were mediating instruments. We're aware of this in the South and in the later 19th century in Appalachia. Um, and it's not extravagant <coughs> to claim that the first truly American music, that is a music that was not predominantly European or African, wasn't the ragtime and jazz of the turn of the 20th century, as it is often claimed, but was the fiddle and fiddle banjo dance music that resulted from the black-white musical interchange in the 19th century, an exchange in which French and Native Americans also were involved. One of the least known aspects of that interchange is that which took place in the North. But we're fortunate that a great American genre painter of the early to the 19th century in William Sidney Mount who lived from 1807 to 1868, and that's a picture of him right there in the center. And now I'm going to have to move over here so that I can reach the. Can you still hear me okay? Yes. Yep. I'm going to have to cast my gaze down on here and move the crank pad and all this sort of stuff. This is uh, what William Sidney Mount looked like. There are a number of photographs uh, from him, uh, the Gary types and uh, paintings and so on. This is one of the better better ones. Uh, he lived in Long Island, not far from New York 
York City uh, near Stony Brook, and he documented the black-white musical interchange. Some of you may have seen some of his, uh, his paintings, but I'll bet you haven't seen as many as you're going to see today. <laughs> <laughs> of course, if you pause to think about it, cities like New York in the early Republic were magnets for musicians of all kinds. I became aware of Mount's paintings when writing my dissertation on blues back in 1970, and I used one of his pictures in early down-home blues, the uh, book, as well as in the dissertation the book. I uh, published in 1977, um, and then that migrated to the back of my inbox. In recent years, the musicologist Chris Smith has been working on a project involving Mount Minstrelsy and the Black White Musical Interchange. I've seen some of his work, and I acknowledge the influence of it upon my own. Mount also happened to be a fiddler, besides being a painter, and he had a ne'er-do-well brother named Robert. This is his <laughs> portrait of Robert. <laughs> Um, this was painted in 1849, and the painting is called Just in Tune, and I'm going to try to douse the lights here, some of them, I'm not sure. Is that better? Yeah. 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 You promise not to fall asleep? Mm -hmm. yeah. Keep your eyes on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> that will keep you awake. This is called Just in Tune, and if you look at it, you'll see that Mount's brother uh, is tuning the fiddle. Notice also how well the fiddle is rendered. If you're used to seeing paintings of musical instruments, you'll be surprised at how well, uh, how realistically they're rendered by William Sidney Mount. He documented uh, the black-white inter uh, musical interchange on fiddle and banjo in uh, Long Island. Um, his brother, as you see here, was a fiddler too, and he was also an itinerant dancing master who spent a lot of time traveling in the South. Uh, this was in the first half of the 19th century. And he needed a continuing supply of dance tunes. William Sidney Mount took it upon himself to mail to his brother Robert a series of fiddle tunes in musical notation, some of which Mount learned from local fiddlers in and around Stony Brook, Long Island some white, some African-American. Altogether, he notated hundreds of them. Equally important for cultural history, he represented the black-white musical interchange in genre paintings without peer or parallel. Let's have a look now at how Mount's paintings do represent that musical mediation, that complementarity, that interchange taking place in, around Long Island and New York. And we can say with some certainty in many other places, although there were not Mount's documented. Although Mount's genre paintings strike the discriminating art critic as sentimental, the music historian sees through the sentimentality to the documentation of the music and dance of that time and place in a way that no other painter rendered. Mount did not succumb to the minstrel stereotype in drawing and painting African Americans. And what is more, perhaps because he himself was a musician, he took care to illustrate the instruments, the playing positions, and the dancing realistically. Let's look at a few more of his portraits of fiddlers and banjo players. His 1856 portrait of a black banjo player is iconic, and if you've seen any painting by Mount, you've probably seen this one, although you may not know that he did. This was 1856. He also, a year earlier, painted a white banjo player. This is a painting called The Banjo Player in the Barn. Can you see that all right? The mm -hmm. banjo player back here. His banjos are accurate uh, also. Um, here is his 1855 painting of <coughs> um, a African-American fiddler. Um, a left-handed fiddler. The, the painting is called Left and Right. Some of his paintings were puns. Uh, this is a left-handed fiddler. Of course, left and right is a dance call. Um, his Just in Tune, that was the name of the painting of his brother. Uh, some people think it's a, uh, uh, it also refers to just intonation of the fiddle. I think that's a bit of a stretch, but we can uh, leave it at that. Um, these were all local musicians that Mount painted, and they are identifiable. Chris Smith is on the track of identifying them. This, the bone player, he called, uh, and uh, this was painted around the same time as Right and Left, 1856. 
Mount understood also a good deal about music and dancing. Here is an 1835 painting of a solo dancer. Don't know how well you can see this. This is the dancer right here. Can you see my little arrow? Mm -hmm. Yes. And there's no instrument. But this gentleman here is clapping out the rhythm. Can you see the hands mm -hmm. clapping here? And here uh, uh, is a jug. This is ubiquitous in Mount's music paintings. Mm -hmm. And if you look here, there is a black man who is standing to the side and listening and looking on. This is called the barroom scene. Uh, and later he called it the breakdown. About 20 years ago, I learned that old time Kentucky fiddler Manon Campbell learned tunes from his mother who didn't play the fiddle but who whistled the tunes to her son. In the days before recordings, whistling tunes and learning them from whistling was not uncommon. Here, unfortunately, this is kind of small, is a mount painting. This is the man who's whistling the tune. And here is the fiddler who's listening. There are people looking on as well. This painting is called Catching the Tune. Catching the Tune. <laughs> 